Welcome to the future. Get ready to explore how spirituality and science will come together in the age of Aquarius. Hosted by JC Nova. Today on the show, I'm talking with Renee Watt, the brilliant celebrity psychic who comes from a long lineage of strong women with psychic abilities. She's been featured in many popular magazines, including Cosmo, In Style, and Teen Vogue. It's a great conversation on tapping into your intuition, the power of magic, and connecting with spirit in the age of Aquarius. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Age of Aquarius. Today on the show, we have Renee Watt. She is a celebrity psychic and podcast host that comes from a long lineage of strong women with psychic abilities. She's been featured in well-known publications like Cosmo, In Style, and Teen Vogue, and she's also the host of her own weekly podcast, The Glitter Cast, which explores witchcraft and spirituality, giving listeners the tools they need for their own spiritual journey. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Renee. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you. I'd really love for our listeners to get to know you better. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the story behind how you first discovered your gift? Yeah, I mean, I feel like with so many intuitive people, it kind of begins as whispers of intuition when you're a child. You know, for me, I got my first tarot deck when I was 10 years old, and it was just because you know, I was the youngest of four kids and my eldest brother had a girlfriend who had a tarot deck and she showed me hers. And so I saved up my allowance and she took my sister and I to a new age store a couple weeks later and I bought the Rider Waite deck. And, you know, I'm a Scorpio and Scorpios can be pretty obsessive. <laughs> and so that's kind of like where I started to go down my occult path. I was bringing my tarot cards to recess and there would be a crowd of little like 10 year old kids around me getting their tarot cards read. And then that was just always something that I was pulling out at sleepovers or even just on my own time. Like I was just, you know, fascinated by the concept that I could get insight that I felt like I was cut off to before I had this tool. And then Uh, About two years later, I was walking through a used bookstore and uh, it was called Mr. Books. It was on like 35th and Bell. If there are any Arizona people listening to this, I grew up in Phoenix. And so we didn't have a lot of access to culture or things that really deviated from mainstream media or beliefs or spiritual practices at that period of time. The city has grown a lot, but so I was, I was walking through this used bookstore and there was a section that had astrology books and witchcraft books. And I never really thought of witchcraft as something outside of Hollywood, you know, fairy tales until I found this book. And then suddenly it like became real that I I could potentially practice witchcraft. And so I got a book by Scott Cunningham called Wicca, a guide for the solitary practitioner. And my friend that I was with also got a book on witchcraft. And we both read our books. And then we swapped books. And by my 13th birthday, I was forming a coven. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. My, like, <laughs> middle school friends, which, you know, in hindsight, it was, you know, it's it's little kid stuff, right? So it's not like I really knew what to do with witchcraft. I, I was, you know, putting glamour magic spells on myself and hoping boys would like me, you know, but we were very devoted with our hot topic pentacles and, and, you know, we were practicing and we were calling corners at sleepovers, but it was just sort of like my introduction, which, you know, for me, a lot of it was I was raised Catholic. And as a woman, I saw that there was no real way for me to have a platform. I remember asking, you know, why weren't any women priests and being told because only men have a direct line of communication with God. And I immediately was turned off. You know, I went from wanting to be a priest to realizing that it wasn't the right religion for me and then enter witchcraft. (laughs) And here we are today. 
What's been the best outcome of a spell you've performed? I mean, I really honestly feel like my current partnership is the the best result that I've ever had from a spell. And I remember I was actually taking a class called the Deity is in the details. It's taught by a woman named Scarlett, who sometimes teaches at the Crooked Path in Burbank. And it was, you know, at the end of this class, we were learning all about Pan, who is one of the deities that I work with when I do work with deities, but we learned about Pan. And at the end, we did this ritual to him. And we were basically like asking for what we wanted to manifest. And for me, you know, I, I decided I was going to get two wishes in at once. And I wanted, you know, I wanted a good partner, which I had had a hard time finding. I'd been single for a few years. And then I also wanted, you know, like essentially a manager or someone who could help me with my career. And I remember as I'm writing down my intentions, which we burned, um, as I was writing down my intentions, I saw like a, a portal, like a brown portal open um, on the floor. And it was just in my peripheral vision because I really was like focusing on what I was writing. But I, as a clairvoyant, I was like, oh, shit, like there's there. That's like a portal or an orb or something. And I didn't really feed too much into it. I just thought it was like a very magical thing to go along with this ritual. And then a couple months later, while I was on a date with someone else, I met my boyfriend who actually um, is a talent manager. And (laughs) and it just ended up being this two for one kind of uh, wish where I ended up with this amazing supportive partner who also, you know, is pretty good at helping me with business advice. That's a great story because that's about you basically setting intentions and bringing the energy in to, I, would you say it's like you're opening up your own energy so that you could could attract him into your life? Yeah. And I mean, I feel like it could be like that's half of it and the other half is the universe kind of conspiring to make it happen. And I don't think that the universe will you know, like, I don't think every single spell manifests. And I think a lot of that depends on whether or not it's actually good for your path. But in this instance, I would say it was for me. And what's funny is, you know, I did this ritual to Pan. And when I met my boyfriend, and we were dating, of course, like I'm pulling tarot cards, you know, whenever I have a question about him. And I kept pulling from my Greek mythology deck. And every time I asked about him, I pulled the devil which is Pan in <laughs> in the deck. And so every time I asked a question about him, my Pan would show up and I was like, oh, okay, like this is, this is the ritual I did to Pan. Here it is. That's interesting. So has there been any readings in particular that stood out for you, whether you're doing readings for yourself or say someone else? Yes. You know, it's so funny because it's <laughs> like, it was kind of one of my first profound clairaudient experiences, which is like, you know, clairvoyant is your ability to see messages or have, you know, prophetic visions where clairaudience is sort of like hearing a voice. And I was working from the shop in Burbank that I used to work out of. And this woman sat down. And the second she sat down, I just heard a voice say to me, which I, you know, which I repeated to her, I said, Hey, sorry, if this is like weird, but you have a UTI. And if you don't take care of it, it's going to turn into a kidney infection. And her jaw dropped. And she was like, I literally was just at the doctor. And it is a kidney infection. (laughs) And I was like, all right, so what do you want to talk about? Like, it was just like, such a specific and like, almost an uncomfortable thing to bring up with someone in the first five seconds of meeting them. But it just like, it just kind of blew my mind that something whispered something to me, I decided to take a chance and say it. And it was like very accurate. What tools do you typically use when you're doing a reading for someone? Is it tarot? Is it intuitive? Or is it a mix? It's definitely a mix. I, you know, before I have a session with anybody, I will take about 20 to 30 minutes and I get in a meditative state and I always ask clients to send a picture of themselves and I'll sit with their photo and just tap in, see what comes through in the channel. And I usually have a page or two of notes at the beginning of any session that I do, unless it's astrology, which is kind of a different process. But 
So there's definitely intuitive stuff that comes through. And sometimes I will work solely from my intuition. If there's enough that we need to talk about, if, if I'm, you know, examining someone's chakras and there's a lot there and there's a lot to go through, it, it could be an entire session that's intuitive. But if we are looking at, you know, wanting to pull more details out of a situation, I will, you know, bring tarot cards into the mix. Uh, but then astrology, you know, that's that's charts. And a lot of times if I'm doing an astrology reading, it's just astrology, though I do think that my intuition helps me draw parallels between the chart and what's going on with this person. Using all these tools and, and it's part of your, your daily life or your daily practice, how has your gifts changed your life over the years? I definitely think that... I've always had an empathic nature. I have always been pretty absorbent to the energy that surrounds me, but I was so I was so convinced that I was this independent thinker that I wasn't really aware of how some of the people around me were influencing me. And I do still think that I'm an independent thinker and that I was back then, but I'm just smarter at protecting my energy. And so being an independent person, it feels more true. And I think that I have more self-awareness because I've just learned to identify what my aura is and when someone else is imprinting on me. And then I can make a decision about whether or not I want to take on, you know, the energy of this person. And so it's definitely helped me, you know, use discernment in my relationships as well, because I think when you're an empath and you haven't really come to terms with that or you haven't really discovered that about yourself, it can be really messy. Just not knowing when you're picking up stuff or when it's yours. And I think that learning how to process my own emotions and my own energy, it, it just makes it so much easier to navigate the world in a way that's healthy. Maybe you can give some advice on how people can clear energy because, you know, you may be affected by friends, family, maybe they've had a bad day, they're sad. And some people, you know, unconsciously may be giving off, you know, negative vibes. So if you can talk a little bit more about some of maybe the rituals you have to clear energy, I think would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I do think that if you are really serious about wanting to understand subtle energy, the best thing that you can do is get a consistent meditation practice going. When I had my psychic awakening, which happened, you know, when I was about 27 or 28, I felt like I had no choice. It, it just it was like suddenly everything was coming through too strongly. And so I had to figure out how to mellow out. So I think that like, you know, if someone's in this situation where they know that they're hypersensitive, it really, you should start like meditating four or five times a week, 15 to 20 minutes, just set a timer and sit down and do it and don't just do it. Don't think about it one way or the other. In terms of like practices, I like to visualize myself in a ball of white cleansing, healing light. This is pretty standard for the industry where you just sort of like inhale that white light Exhale, black smoke, continue to inhale white light until it turns gray, and then until it turns white. And then you've just sort of created this purity within yourself and within your aura. And what's nice about this practice is, you know, people say to like bubble up or to like get in your bubble or call in your protection. And for me, what that looks like is a sphere of light around me that, you know, people can can come into if I have developed trust with them, you know, and if I've if I've made a conscious decision to let my guard down emotionally, then it's like, I don't have to do the work. They're just they're just allowed to come into my sphere. But I think that also, you know, if you're not if you're not super into meditation, if you have a hard time, because your mind is too busy, guided meditations are good. But even just walking in nature, if you're someone whose mind doesn't quiet, getting out in nature, breathing fresh air, you know, stimulating your senses in a way that's not complicated. So you're just like smelling something and feeling the texture of something. These are all really good ways to ground and center yourself so that you can push out what doesn't belong to you. Salt baths are great. I like to put baking soda in my baths. I will say I don't recommend sage if it, you know, unless there is 
a really, really, really bad argument or something, or you've just moved into a new house, I, I tend to stay away from sage. I will use juniper or cedar just because sage is, it just purges everything, both good and bad. And if you do use sage, you're going to want to follow up with a blessing because otherwise you can sort of create this vacuum where you've pushed out all energy and then like anything can come in. So if you do use sage, you want to like follow up with a blessing because you want to fill this space with good, with good energy. So I know that you talked about astrology and obviously all of us are going through some, some big changes in our life moves, the pandemic, all kinds of different, different things happening work. What role do you think astrology can play during this time? And, and how do you use astrology in your daily life? I, I, I'm a full-time astrologer in the sense that I'm writing horoscopes pretty much every day. I'm, I'm writing about what's going on <laughs> astrologically. And so within my life, it, it, it's really my, my work at all times. But personally, I do like to, you know, I like to know where the moon is at because the moon is the closest celestial body to us and it impacts our emotions and so I think that it's really helpful to kind of follow along with where the moon is because it does change signs every two and a half days. And this is especially important for cancers to keep in mind or people with strong cancer placements because cancer is ruled by the moon, like Scorpio is ruled by Mars and Virgo is ruled by Mercury. We have cancer ruled by the moon. And so that means that cancers are the most sensitive to these changes that are happening every two and a half days. And, you know, what's nice also, even if you're not a cancer is like today, for instance, the moon is in Virgo. And so Virgo is a really organized, really productive, really just sort of on the mark type of energy. So if I know the moon's in, or in Virgo, I'm going to try to handle as much logistical stuff as I can, because the energy is right for that. And then when the moon goes into Libra, that's when it's time to kind of find your balance and check in with yourself and de-stress and decompress. Scorpio is good for releasing. Sagittarius is really optimistic and lucky. And so if you can kind of just follow the moon's, you know, the moon's phases, it can just do so much for helping you move along with the rhythms of the world. What does age of Aquarius mean to you? A lot of People talk about Age of Aquarius, obviously, in astrology, but also just in pop culture in general. And I'm just curious what the Age of Aquarius means to you, and maybe you can explain it a little bit for the listeners. Yeah, I mean, in, you know, in the astrology community, the Age of Aquarius is a little bit of a nebulous sort of concept. There's never really been an across-the-board agreement about when the Age of Aquarius started or if we're in it, or if it started in the 60s, you know what I mean? Like, there's not, there's not a specific point in time that people are saying, like, yes, this is when it started. But I will say that the Great Conjunction last year did kind of ring a lot of bells in terms of the age of Aquarius. And we did have a lot of Aquarius energy happening as, like last year. And so I think that's kind of where this resurgence of the age of Aquarius sort of folklore started to come in. I mean, I'm all for it because the age of Aquarius, if we are going to look at it from what that energy means, it is about, you know, Aquarius energy is about revolutionizing things. It's about changing our structures to modernize which has been kind of hard for us as a society, especially, you know, last year because we had Saturn which is one of the rulers of Aquarius and Uranus, which is the other ruler of Aquarius, they were kind of fighting with each other. They, they formed a square, which is a difficult and a harsh aspect three times last year. And because they're both like slower moving planets, when we see aspects, it, it kind of packs a punch. And I feel like we had a lot of like, you know, one step forward, two steps back especially within our political climate. And so I feel like we're trying to move away from this place where we're making ourselves stuck because we're so divided. And hopefully, you know, how this will unfold in the next couple of years is that we'll grow past that and we'll grow out of that. 
But it is really hard to say exactly how things will unfold because Aquarius energy is so unpredictable. And sometimes it moves really quickly. So it could be like, all of a sudden, everything has changed, and we don't feel prepared for it. And so it, it can be a peculiar time in terms of like this, you know, the political and social climate. But what's really nice about, you know, how it can affect technology is that it is the most technologically advanced member of the Zodiac. And it is about like, how do we how do we grow our intellect? How do we grow upon what we've already built? And so we can continue to see a lot of really amazing discoveries and innovations. And I think that science will have a lot of breakthroughs. What's nice about it, too, is that, you know, during the age of Aquarius, when we when we think about how it is glamorized, a lot of it is about almost like a renaissance period where we have made our lives easier through technology and we're able to kind of focus on art and creating a little bit more uh, or humanitarian efforts as well. So I think that there's a lot of potential for beauty. If we're just talking about some of the planets, what's happening with us astrologically in 2022 and then going into 2023, what should we be mindful of or what should listeners be mindful of as some of the changes or aspects that might be coming up over the next year? So we actually just had a really big one. We had the nodes of fate switch signs. They were in Gemini and Sagittarius, and now they are in Taurus and Scorpio. And the nodes of fate, they're kind of like the North and South Pole of the moon. But the role that they play is they're the nodes of fate, right? So this is like the winds of change. This is fated events. This is, you know, seizing destiny. And so we just had the switch occur. And so there are a lot of changes happening, big life changes that are just starting to kind of unravel for people. And this energy, it's going to be lasting for a year and a half. And it's going to coincide with the eclipses that we have coming up, you know, throughout the next year and a half, because eclipses are so much about they're almost destabilizing, because they push you into the path that you're supposed to be on. And so when we're looking at the North Node in Taurus, this is very much a situation where we are trying to build, we are trying to take things a little bit slower, we're trying to tap into our gratitude and appreciate our surroundings and fall back in love with beauty, because we've had so much of that taken away from us since the pandemic hit. With the South Node being in Scorpio, the South Node is a releasing energy. This is what we're trying to get rid of. So the North Node is what is where we're heading. The South Node is what we're releasing. And with the South Node in Scorpio, that's an extremely powerful place for it to be because Scorpio is the sign of death. It's transformation. Scorpio is ruled by Pluto. And when we had, you know, the beginning of 2020, we had... Saturn and Pluto form a conjunction, which is basically they're right on top of each other in the sky. So like, basically, what that did was that bulldozed our structures. And that happened in January. And then in March, we all went into lockdown, right? And, you know, political upheaval ensued. So we just went through this period where like, all of our structures were bulldozed. And this is like, now this is the time where we're releasing what kind of has been destroyed or what needs to be destroyed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. How do you think it'll continue to affect politics over the next couple of years? Obviously, we have elections in 2022 in the US and then another presidential election two years later. The one thing that I feel, it's like every day it feels like something's shifting. The energy is constantly shifting. And I'm a big believer in energy. And I think that we can all work together on, say, a local local basis or on our own consciousness level to kind of shift energy and move things in the direction that we're hoping we'd like it to go in. But obviously some people do better than others when it comes to change. And I think a lot of people are looking towards astrology to have that guidance of kind of like a a weather report of what can I expect? Are you a believer in fate or do you think that we have free will to make changes, even though the aspects might be difficult, we can work with those aspects to try to get the best result. 
Honestly, I'm a believer in both. I'm like the reincarnation, you know, believe in all that stuff. You've got lessons to learn. You know, I'm on, I'm on that wavelength. And so I think that like, you know, before you come back down, you kind of sign up for a few lessons and you kind of sign up to, you know, maybe be in the lives of certain people. And that's where we, you know, that's when we meet someone and we feel like they're a soulmate. You know, I think we have more than one soulmate too, but I think that there are these sort of staples and we maybe don't hit all of them, but we hit some of them and that's kind of where destiny or fate plays a role. But I also think that like, we have free will and that there are multiple paths to choose from. So, you know, maybe missing the staple of fate will just open you up to a different staple of fate. So I think that fate is fluid and we do have free will, but I very much think that fate exists and destiny exists, you know, with the South node being in Scorpio and how that might affect the political climate too, is I I believe that we're going to be learning more about what exactly happened during the, the the coup, basically, in January, on January 6th, I think that we're going to be digging up kind of the seedy underbelly of politics, and even like the corporate world, because Scorpio is the big investigator of the zodiac sign. And so with the South Node being in Scorpio, if there is, you know, if people have been trying to get away with stuff, they might not be able to. And, you know, the energy could work where people are able to get way through stuff too, but it's also going to reveal a lot because it's going to get to the bottom of the story. Do you think we'll continue to be tribal? It feels very tribal right now. Yeah, I mean, it does. And I I want to be optimistic, but I'm not. <laughs> I think that we're going to try to work at mending some of the division that exists, but it almost feels like we need some sort of huge event to happen in order for us all to get on the same page. And that kind of worries me in some ways too, because it makes me wonder what, like, what that looks like, because also I'm just some astrologer thinking this on my own. There are certainly politicians who are thinking the same thing. And then there's, you know, weird stuff going on with Russia right now. And Putin's talking about war. And it's like, man, I hope it doesn't go there. I really, really hope it doesn't go there. But it, you know. Sometimes I think about, because I work in cybersecurity or in the technology industry, and I think about the metaverse and, you know, Facebook changing its name to Meta and working with the communities, because we're becoming more and more virtual. And that has such an impact on on all of us, but specifically about younger people that if, if more of their social interaction is more online versus in person, I guess that's very Aquarian. But I'm just, I'm just kind of curious where you see that evolving. Does that raise our vibration and we have a higher consciousness? Or as we can see, the negative side of social media or the negative side of technology can also make people less empathetic. I'm just curious where you see it going. I think that I honestly feel like it's such a mixed bag and it can go in so many different directions. I mean, I think that it's amazing that we have so much access to information, but I also think that there are huge issues happening within social media that I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you could attest to. Um, I can't, I can't remember what it was called. There was a Netflix documentary about, I think it was called like even just like the social network or something like that. But it was basically about how, you know, based on the way that different algorithms are within social media, people who live in certain regions are, you know, like certain Facebook, Facebook groups are suggested to them. And it's kind of contributed to this rise in fanaticism. That worries me because there is a lot of toxicity online and there's a lot of really harmful information that people subscribe to as truth. And so while technology is this wonderful, amazing gift, it also it does have, you know, a, like a seedy underbelly to it. 
I don't have the bandwidth to even think about how we would solve that. Or, you know, even if that's something that we should be, you know what I mean? And so I think that like the places it could go are so vast. I think it's great for connecting. I have built my entire career off of utilizing technology, social media pages, podcasts. I mean, I reach all of my followers through my horoscopes online every day. So it's just, it it feels like a vortex to me. (laughs) Well, what I do like about technology and social media that you can connect with people that you wouldn't possibly connect with. I like to sometimes like, before the pandemic, you'd have meetups and you would actually go to a meetup physically in the city that you live in. Now, pretty much all the meetups are virtual. So lots of times I will join a meetup that might be in London or might be in Sydney because I think, oh, I would I would enjoy sitting in and trying to hear their perspective of what they think about a particular topic. Usually I'm, I'm really more focused on, I want to talk about artificial intelligence or age of Aquarius, things that are changing. I think for me, the biggest concern I have is about misinformation because a lot of people get their news from social media, but it's kind of the rumor mill. A person told another person told another person and, you know, you lose a lot of the facts along the way. And I think that is the biggest challenge. I know that internationally, um, for example, WhatsApp in India, uh, you know, had caused like mass riots because of misinformation that was passed through WhatsApp and it wasn't factual and like thousands of people took to the streets. So in some countries, Facebook and and WhatsApp is kind of their connection to the world. Whereas in our country, it's much more, you know, you have a several different resources that you can use to find out information and choose to think or believe what you want. So the age of Aquarius, I think, is going to be interesting in that aspect. What are some significant astrological aspects coming up, you know, in 2022 that the listeners should be mindful of? I mean, I do think that the biggest one was kind of just the nodes of fate that I think to me is the most pertinent. And that just, that really just happened like in the last day or two. And so Outside of that, I think it's important to watch where Jupiter is. Jupiter is kind of like the planet of luck and expansion. And so wherever Jupiter is in, in your chart, that's kind of where you're going to be seeing luck that year. And so right now, Jupiter is camped out in Pisces. So it's a really lucky year for Pisces or people with strong Pisces placements. But then it will go into Aries in May, which is exciting for me because my moon is in Aries, but my Jupiter is also in Aries. So that's just kind of like an example of how you would see how it benefits you. One thing that you might want to look at is like which house is ruled by Pisces and Aries. And that's kind of where you're going to see the most growth this year. We do have a really nice sort of connection happening between Jupiter and Neptune. And Neptune is sort of like this planet of dreams. And it's a pretty healing planet. And it's inspirational. And so on April 12th, they're going to be conjunct. And that's going to be a really good time to share ideas and move forward with optimism and explore how we can grow as a society. But the caveat is that Neptunian energy is a lot of fantasy and not a lot of follow through or action. I mean, it rules the dream world. And when you wake up from a dream, it's just a memory, you know, and so what's really important about this April 12th day is that there are actual plans, especially if this is like in your personal life, and you have our ambitions, and you you sense them very strongly on April 12th, you have to follow up with like a real plan. And you have to follow up with doing real work to get yourself there. Um, which will be a challenge because Saturn, the planet that governs sort of like, you know, practicality and planning is going to be in a T square, which is just like a very difficult aspect with the nodes of fate. So it's sort of like, yeah, you can dream for the future all you want. But if you don't, 
if you're not smart about what actualizing these goals looks like, it's going to be a pipe dream forever. So I have one last question and kind of make it on a, on a positive note. What are you looking forward to in 2022? And, you know, tell us a little bit about your podcast and how listeners can find you and listen to your podcast, but also follow your horoscopes as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I think most excited for when Jupiter enters Aries, which is going to be, I believe it is May, like May 10th, it looks like. And for me, you know, with Aries being the first sign in the wheel, this is sort of like a really good time to grow new projects. So any new projects that get off the ground, beginning on May 11th until later in the year, are going to see a lot of growth and potentially quick growth. So, I mean, I would also pay attention to where your Aries placements are in your chart, what house is ruled by Aries. If you have any planets that are in Aries, that's a good thing to keep your eye on. But I think it's just going to be a really refreshing sort of energy and vibe that comes into play. And, you know, we won't see this energy again once it's passed for about another 12 years because Jupiter is such a slow moving planet. So it's really time to embrace like what new chapters do I want to get started in my life? Because that's the time to kind of strike in terms of, you know, where you can find me. I am most active on Instagram. My personal and professional Instagram is at rainbow glitter star. And I post all my articles and stuff on there And then I have at the glitter cast for my podcast, which I just moved. So I I took a small break, but I'm going to start recording again this month. And then I will be, you know, back in the swing of things, but I'm still posting on that Instagram at the glitter cast. I'm posting daily horoscopes, daily memes in terms of publications that I write for. I just started writing for paranormality magazine, which is really fun. It's a monthly horoscope, but It's basically geared toward how we experience the paranormal, how your intuition might be affected by the planetary transits happening, you know, when a good time to practice magic is, what type of magic you should be casting. So it's like the esoteric horoscopes that I write. Um, And then I'm on astrology.com, horoscope.com, and shondaland.com. Amazing. Everyone should go and check out the horoscopes and find out what the future holds for you coming up in the next few months, I'm definitely optimistic about the changes that are coming. And I want to thank you for being on the show, Renee. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, and my website is rainbowglitterstar.com. I think I I I left that out. (laughs) And I do have a, I have a shop on there as well with like spell kits and stuff. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Definitely check out our website. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much. You just heard the Age of Aquarius podcast with your host, JC Nova. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite streaming platform. Thanks for tuning in. Age of Aquarius is a cosmic media production and recorded in Los Angeles, California. A special thanks to our producers, Georgie Rutherford and Christopher Lang. To learn more about Age of Aquarius, please visit our website at ageofaquarius.fm. Thanks for listening.